demonstrators are overwhelmingly very, very young in the recent protests. And I think this is a real sign that the new generation that's coming through is unwilling to heed to the demands of a conservative government, a nationalist Brexit agenda, a dehumanising immigration re regime, and a police force which is being given more powers, more resources, and less and less accountability. I think it's incumbent upon us to support these young people as much as we possibly can, to remain safe during these rebellions, to remain uh, politically focused and to help them to learn the lessons of where older people have failed and things that they've achieved in the past as well. We all know that protests and marches are just one small aspect of political activism. Even Martin Luther King didn't spend most of his time protesting. It's really important that we ensure that young people are able to use their youth clubs and their community centres, community organisations and campaign groups, educational projects and workshops in their colleges or universities or, or local areas. And so once this lockdown is lifted and we can engage with each other properly, we need to make sure that we build something from this moment and make sure that this radical energy is not lost. We want change! We want change! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter. Enough is enough! The last generation! The last generation! The last generation! The last generation! The last generation. A lot of the government and the media have been saying that police racism in Britain and police violence is an American problem. I mean, very much this is a British problem as well. On average, since 1991, one person a week has died at the hands of police, prisons or immigration authorities in this country. And we know that black people are disproportionately affected in these kinds of figures. We also know that black people are incarcerated in this country at the same rate as African Americans. So we have a very real problem within our incarceration rates, as well as a significant problem when it comes to other forms of police brutality. Most of the protests that we've seen over the last week and a half in June haven't been violent at all. So the police have taken a very, very hands-off approach, despite the fact that tens of thousands of people have been protesting across cities in this country. However, there have been some instances in which the police have turned violent. For instance, the first weekend of uh, June, we saw the police becoming very violent towards protesters. We saw uh, riot police uh, being lined up whilst police on horses charged at protesters with such abandon that one of them knocked themselves off a horse by running into a traffic light. The immediate response of the press was to say that protesters pulled a police officer off of their horse, but only after video footage emerged of that officer being knocked off the horse because they themselves ran into a traffic light did we see the media have to take a U-turn on that particular narrative. What this of course tells us is what we've always known. The police often lie about their relationship with black communities and with protesters. They lied about Mark Duggan. They said that there was a shootout when there wasn't one. They lied about John Charles Menzies. They said that he ran away from them when he didn't. They lied about Ian Tomlinson and said that they were defending him from the missiles thrown by protesters, which they didn't. Each time the evidence has shown that the police lied and each time the media parrots their lies. And so we have to ensure that we correct the disinformation which is often spread about protesters, particularly black ones, when it comes to these kinds of rebellions and uprisings and protests. Some years ago, there, there was a campaign called Rose Must Fall, which began in South Africa, where the statue of Cecil Rhodes, one of the architects of apartheid in Southern Africa, was toppled by students at the University of Cape Town. We then saw similar protests in solidarity at Oxford University, where there's also a statue of Cecil Rhodes. But during these Black Lives Matter protests in June, we've seen a statue, a statue of Colston, one of the biggest slave traders in Bristol's history, being taken down as well. Colston was responsible for the trafficking of over 85,000 enslaved Africans from Africa to the Caribbean, where they worked on plantations, often worked to death, to great profit for Colston and other people in Britain. And it's important to remember that statues are not for learning, they're not for education, 
they're for celebrating particular individuals. And for many years, the communities in, in Bristol, particularly black communities, had lobbied for the statue to be taken down and placed in a museum in its proper historical context where relics of the past belong. Instead, it remained, and unsurprisingly, it didn't take too long for the local community to take action. And it's through this direct action we saw that the statue of Colston, the famous slave trader, being taken down and thrown into the river the same waters where many Africans were thrown during the Middle Passage in the slave trade that he made so much money and fame out of. In many ways, these movements seem to have come out of nowhere. Many of the young people who had come out in these protests were protesting for the first time in their lives. We've also seen anti-racist protests in small towns and villages across England and Wales, where there are very few black and Asian people. But people have felt that they need to show solidarity with the people protesting in larger, more multicultural cities. And I think that's a really encouraging sign. What happens next, of course, is that we have to build upon this momentum. We have to ensure that the community centres, the youth clubs, the cultural institutions, the campaign groups are able to work with the young people who turned out in these protests to build educational projects, build social services, build community institutions and everything that we need in order to sustain this struggle.